Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another RATS Technical Sessions webinar. So we are October 21st today, and we have a great presentation on gearing and gearboxes. Uh, just a couple notes I just want to mention. Um, we don't know when we're going in person. It could be November. It could be January 2022. But uh, we'll try to keep you up to date on LinkedIn and on our newsletter. Uh, speaking of which, we're doing our planning for the 2022 MRO conference, technical conference workshops and trade show. And so that will be October 26th, 27th. We'll be uh, sending out some communications on looking for advisory committee members and also you know looking for presentations so anyways look for that we um we're looking to fill our show with a lot of good technical information so i'm going to uh, give it over to jared he's going to introduce our speaker for today and i'll let bernie share his screen perfect Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so we've got a good, interesting presentation today on gearing, and that's going to be presented by Bernie Lahru, and he is the National Sales Manager for TPS Canada, attended Nate um, College for his schooling, um, taking a numerous and various classes for overall studies there. Um, he's been a RAT supporter for over 10 years, as well as Standard Machine has been a sponsor for plus four years. And speaking of MRO, uh, Bernie was a previous MRO presenter for RATS group in the past, which is always a good thing to have. Um, so Bernie, you know, started off with the Gear Center as technical sales and rebuild and service manager from 1983 to 1989 and then worked with SKF Canada in the technical sales and as the Edmonton district sales manager until 97. And then from 97 to present has been with Standard Machine, uh, Timken Power Systems as their technical sales uh, in Alberta and BC, director of sales energy, and um, currently, as mentioned, the national sales manager for TPS Canada. So we thank you, Bernie, for uh, doing the presentation today, and I'll pass it over to you to kick it off. Great. Thank you very much, Jared and uh, Andrew. Uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, it's always good to uh, get a chance to present on a subject that uh, you're involved with. Uh, our industry, the gear industry, is, uh, is keeps everybody in our company very busy. Um, we're all always in a learning um, path, so this is part of... Uh, uh, some of the things that we do is we, we try to continuously uh, understand gearing and gearboxes and how they uh, interact with uh, the, the industrial market. So this is a, a little bit more of a higher level uh, presentation. It's not a deep dive. Um, some of you may have some uh, extensive experience with different types of gearing and gearboxes. Um, this is kind of an overview that talks more about what, what are the considerations that uh, our company or our industry looks at when we're talking about gearing and it's from the gear types to uh, gear selection, um, uh, applications, and then some, uh, some accessories and uh, failure modes. So if uh, we're ready to go, I can take you through and we'll start with um, the first slide. Let's just run a quick poll there, Bernie. I just want to see uh, people's level of understanding. So if you guys see on your screen, you can vote for, uh, and I've made it so you can pick multiple. What is your level of understanding of gearing and gearboxes? I can name things that have gears. I'm familiar with principles, but don't work with them. I work with or on gearboxes. I am very knowledgeable and experienced, or I design, improve, and or re-ratio gearboxes. And uh, I have a herd of elephants running through my house in case you can hear that in the background. I see lots of votes coming in. We're still we're at about uh, sixty percent. Keeps going. It's good. I'm going to close down the poll and uh, 
couple of seconds here, but people are still putting in their votes. So I don't want to stop it just yet. Okay, here we go. Um, sorry, I need All to right. share. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, one more thing. Okay, so 31% of you aren't really that familiar. 35% uh, are familiar, and then again, 35% have worked on gearboxes, and then it goes down from there. 27% very knowledgeable, and then 4% would be maybe considered expert level. So thank you very much. We'll continue. Good. Thanks, Andrew. That's a pretty interesting uh, result. So um, let's start with uh, the, the presentation overview. Andrew, let me make sure that everybody's seeing my screen. I just want to check with that first. Yeah, looks good. Okay. So uh, presentation overview, we're going to talk about drivetrain basics, uh, gear element types and design, gearbox design and configurations, uh, somewhat about applications. Uh, we're going to look at upgrades, uh, failure modes, and then there's one section that I didn't uh, list on here and I added it yesterday, and that's uh, a sample failure analysis for uh, a gearbox so we can have a look at how we go through that and uh, starting with drivetrain basics so why do we need a gearbox what's the function so with the different drivers we have we have diesel engines turbines electric motors um, the gearbox basically bridges the gap so we're reducing or increasing the speed we can reverse the direction of the rotation and we can uh, uh, increase or reduce the torque. So it, it, it's a critical part of the drivetrain. And then the next thing we look at is gearbox selection. So we need application information. Uh, all too often we get asked to provide a, a, a gearbox for specific application, but we, uh, we don't get all of the information. Uh, it's, it's important when we're doing a selection that we get as much information as we can. So we wanna know what the drivers are, the driven equipment, uh, the demands of it, of course, the orientation, are we in line, are we parallel, are we going to be vertical? Uh, what type of couplings are we gonna use? And what are the operating conditions? And any applicable specifications. So depending on what industry you are in, you will have different specifications. And of course, input speed is greater than output speed. That's a reducer. And if it's the opposite, which is higher input speed and uh, lower output speed, uh, or sorry, the input speed is less than the output speed, we have an increaser. Uh, first thing we do is let's look at the types of drivers. So there is, a, there is quite a, uh, a variation of drivers. And every application will have its own uh, specific drivers. Electric motors available are DC motors for variable speed. We have induction motors, uh, provide constant speed, and synchronous motors, which is constant and variable speed. Uh, turbines, we have com combustion turbines. We have steam turbines, hydro turbines, which are, uh, are more in use uh, in, in parts of the world where there's uh, a lot more access to water, uh, flowing water. And then we have wind turbines, which we're starting to see a lot more uh, growth in that market in the last few years. And lastly, we have multi-cylinder internal combustion engines, which are gas and diesel. So what's our driven equipment? This is a very short list. We have so many out there, but I'm gonna just cover a few. And these are the, probably um, equipment that you see in the fields that you're we're all working in. So there are compressors, pumps, propellers, which can be considered wind turbines, fans, different types of mill equipment, which we find in steel, aluminum, and in pulp and paper. Conveyors, these conveyors are multitude of, this, of types of conveyors, but uh, generally they all use some form of a gearbox. Pulverizers and crushers, so we have coal, cement, and gypsum. Uh, generators, uh, there's people movers and extruders. Uh, test stands, uh, we find that uh, that's a very specific market, but there is definitely a lot of uh, test stands out there for various industries. So one of the first things we look at is couplings. 
Well, couplings, they, of course, they connected different pieces of equipment together. Uh, what we look for in many cases is what kind of couplings will allow a certain amount of misalignment where this is necessary for the application. Uh, different coupling designs they favor uh, are favored based on uh, application, power speed, budget and maintenance requirements. And of course, they can be oil, grease or dry. And I'll show you a couple of type, a uh, few types on the next slide. Let's look at gear couplings. Uh, they are grease lubricated. They have a moderate cost and they're good for misalignment. So any application that we find that that is the desired arrangement, then we look at gear couplings. Uh, another type is disc couplings. So we have the flexible disc between the flanges. Uh, they're dry and maintenance free. Uh, they're moderate. Misalignment capability is, is, uh, is fine for a lot of applications. And uh, diaphragm couplings, where there's a thin flexible diaphragm between flanges they have uh, higher power and speed capabilities, but of course, that comes with a higher cost. Uh, let's talk about gear element types and design. So we have helical. It's probably the most common gear type. Um, they are, uh, the, the gears are have parallel axes, uh, so they run uh, parallel to each other. Uh, the tooth form is uh, smooth and uh, gives an accurate mating action. Uh, the power capacity depends on the tooth form and the center distance uh, between mating members. You know, width or face, material and hardness are all taken into account for uh, meeting the power capacity. Uh, the helix angle on a tooth generates a thrust which impacts the bearing design. If you're using a single helical, uh, you're going to have to have a bearing that's going to be able to manage the thrust that's going to be generated between the two uh, mating gears. Double helical design is uh, a type of gear arrangement that uh, cancels all thrust, so it allows you to use a different type of uh, 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 bearing in that type of gearbox. So a double helical design is very favored on high speed and high power applications. As I sh show on that slide, you can see the gearbox, the lower gearbox is quite a bit different than the uh, low speed uh, single helical above. We also have spiral bellows. So this is where the axis of the mating shaft is at 90 degrees. And there's a lot of different applications that require that. So, um, they're only offered in match sets. Spiral bevels are unique in that uh, you cannot mismatch them. You cannot repair them. Uh, you cannot buy a new pinion and, and mount it against an existing gear. Uh, they are in match sets and they're ground that way. They're more expensive and they have longer lead times. In many cases, if we sell a gearbox where there's a spiral bevel set in a gearbox, the critical spare would be that spiral bevel gear set. So we always uh, recommend that if you're not going to spare the whole gearbox, uh, then at least spare the spiral bevel gear set. So uh, they're in one meter plus diameter, and uh, they, of course, um, impacted by poor sales of machine tools and new technologies that are replacing spiral bevel gear sets. Another type of gear is a worm gear. So this technology is very old technology, but it's still in use today. Many applications require it as a right angle drive. So we have a bronze uh, worm wheel and it running against the steel worm shaft. So you can get a high ratio and you can uh, lock the gear set in place. So it's got, uh, it's got some versatility. Primarily used on low speeds. Um, they're inefficient due to the high sliding action. And that's one of the uh, uh, that's one of the, the types of gears that seem to be getting replaced with other uh, gearboxes um, just due to the, uh, the, the inefficiency of worm, gear, worm gearboxes. Uh, small worm boxes are also commodities, so they're not really repairable. Uh, on the upside, uh, there's the double enveloping design that's currently being used in much more uh, applications today. They have a higher load capacity, lower contract stress, and uh, they can manage uh, much more torque. 
So we also look at gearbox configurations. So when we talk about rotation, so um, the required rotation dictates the number of gear elements. So if we're going to go with uh, opposite or uh, we're going to go with uh, uh, depending on the uh, rotation of the motor or the, the, uh, the driver and the uh, driven equipment, we might have to introduce another set of uh, gears to get the rotation we need. Uh, on bevels, the gear over and gear under really uh, drives the rotation of the, uh, the output shaft. And the same applies for horizontal shafts. We look at gear geometry. So this is some of the words and terminology we use in our industry. Uh, center distance is always critical. We always have to be absolutely sure what uh, center distance we're working with when we're uh, providing a new gear center or designing a gearbox. Uh, whether it be a vertical or horizontal application, center distance is very important. The uh, pressure angle on a gear tooth is, it drives uh, a lot of the decisions on um, uh, whether we're going to get a higher capacity, stronger tooth, or whether we're going to um, be able to supply a much finer tooth with a, a lower pressure angle. And the helix angle is generally, um, it, it's, it's pr uh, proprietary to the gear manufacturer. Everybody uh, that's in our in the gear business may use a different uh, helix angle in their gearing, and uh, they're not nominal. Generally, they're uh, very specific to the uh, the brand or the OEM. So, uh, helix angle is uh, also very much in consideration when we're designing gearing and gearboxes. Some of the other terminology we use is effective uh, face width. So uh, the we, the face width terminology basically refers to the width of the gears. Um, the, we have right hand and left hand. Uh, it's important to understand whether you're using, whether you're supplying a right or left hand uh, helical gear. And then when we're talking about double helix, um, we're introducing a gap. And uh, when we're manufacturing gear teeth, uh, today's technology with the grinding process, we need a wider gap in order to run the tool through so that we uh, so that we can uh, manufacture the gear and grind it, uh, we introduce a gap, and that's uh, that's an important uh, measurement for us for our tooling to make sure we can get our tools through it. So when we design a gearbox or uh, some open gearing, uh, backlash is very important to the consideration. So that backlash is basically the difference between the width of the gear, tooth, and the, and the tooth space. Uh, if you have inefficient backlash, that can lead to failure. And changes over uh, time will indicate where, and, and that's uh, one of the ways that we can measure where over time is checking the backlash. Again, uh, the difference with the width of the gear tooth and the gear tooth space uh, is the backlash. And uh, I've shown here in the diagram, really, the two types of stresses that we see on a gear tooth. We have the contact stress and the bending stress that's at the root. Design considerations. So when our engineering is uh, looking at uh, whatever industry we're going to be supplying a gearbox to or uh, the consideration of the uh, design of what type of gear, uh, gearbox we're going to supply. So we look at the design standards. There's AGMA, the American Gear Manufacturers Association has their standards. Uh, that's traditionally North America. Uh, API is an international uh, standard for uh, petroleum industry. And uh, Europe uh, uses uh, predominantly the DIN standard, which is another form of uh, design standard that is available, that we see gearboxes uh, coming into our country designed to. Uh, you also have customer specification considerations. What is the customer actually looking for? What is his expectation? Uh, pitch line velocity is taken into consideration. Um, System considerations such as is what is this gearbox going to inter integrate into as far as um, equipment that is uh, going to be part of the system? And are we designing to an exact or to a nominal ratio? So 
So the further uh, the gearbox design and cons uh, configurations, we'll look at this part of our slide deck. So we have bearing selection. That's really critical to designing gearboxes. Are we using a, a rolling element style uh, bearing or are we gonna go to a hydrodynamic fluid film style sleeve bearing? They work completely different and the, they apply to different types of gearboxes. We look at shaft design considerations. So when you're introducing horsepower and torque into a gearbox, you're gonna have uh, certain uh, conditions that will happen to the gearing and to the shaft. So we, we design based on the bending deflection and the torsional or twisting deflection of the gearbox, of the gearing inside the gearbox. The stresses that we uh, are designing to will be bending stresses, torsional stresses and fatigue stresses. And of course, we take into consideration vibration. So there's lateral vibration frequencies and torsional frequencies. All of these, um, all of these considerations are part of our design and will be, um, uh, will be um, driving our decision on what we're gonna build for size and gear types and shaft sizes and extension diameters and lengths. Next, we have to look at the housing. Uh, are, we, uh, are we designing with enough rigidity? So is the, is the gear case strong enough to hold the shafts? Uh, the strength, we need to keep the stress levels below the allowable uh, ratings for the gearbox. Manufacturing, are we going to fabricate? Or are we going to cast the housing? Today's society um, in the industries that we deal with, if, if, if we're making a mass produced gearbox, generally casting is preferred uh, on a lot of special engineered designs, we will, we will move towards a fabricated gearbox due to the cost and the fact that you're not providing mul uh, multiple gearboxes. And we look at the assembly. What, how do we make this uh, assembly easy and maintenance uh, friendly? when we design it. Vibration is important. We need to prevent structural frequencies um, and oil management. What's the capacity? How are we gonna supply this gearbox? And how are we gonna get the drainage? Um, when we design new gearboxes, we also, also use uh, the finite element analysis program. And we look at the weaknesses and strengths of the gearbox to ensure that we, um, we have a gearbox that's gonna be uh, able to operate in the conditions and uh, avoid some of the uh, inherent frequencies that you'll see when you match it up with other uh, associated equipment. Seal designs are very important. Uh, lip seals are pretty standard in low speed gearboxes and they have speed capacities up to approximately 2000 RPM. And there's flexible materials, rubber and Teflon and Vite on them. Uh, for higher speed applications or, or applications where lip seals need to be replaced with a better seal, we look at uh, labyrinth seals. So we have high speed applications and they remove oil from the shaft and uh, their effectiveness really depends on uh, the clearance between the seal and the shaft. And lastly, we look at, are we gonna provide an engineered uh, gearbox or is this going to be a catalog gearbox that's selected based on uh, uh, fitting the, uh, the gearbox, sorry, the application to the gearbox. So when we look at standard catalog products, we look at, uh, they are generally mass produced. Uh, they're designed to suit the broadest number of applications. Uh, design compromises to minimize costs. So we, we know that we're going to have to compromise in some areas and uh, to meet the cost, the market uh, driven cost levels. And uh, there usually are some compromises. And of course they're lower costs and the reliability generally is a little lower. Uh, with engineered products, you're, you're, you're designing and you're optimizing to meet the exact requirements of the application. And they're engineered for ease of maintenance and the highest reliability, but they're also the highest cost. Configurations, the standard uh, industry configuration would be a parallel shaft gearbox. So we have horizontal or vertical 
configurations. Uh, most frequently, they're single helical. Uh, common configuration, uh, most common, uh, these gearboxes fit all applications in all markets. They, uh, they can be designed to a uh, variety of power and speed capabilities and ratios and reductions. And uh, generally, uh, they are produced in larger quantities. High-speed double helical gearboxes, the, this is a little bit different market. Um, shaft RPMs generally are above 4,500. The pitch line velocity is generally over 7,500 feet per minute. Uh, they're a much higher accuracy design gearbox uh, and manufactured. Uh, they're frequently seen in petrochemical power generation applications. Uh, they have uh, a higher sensitivity to uh, to risk factors uh, uh, in, in, in general in the application. They have a wide variety of power and speed. There's many fewer uh, manufacturers in this market. Uh, they're generally a, an engineered product and they're mostly sold to OEMs uh, when they're first introduced to the market. There's a, a bevel helical configuration. So they're usually selected for gearboxes with a greater than a six to one ratio. And typical applications are large conveyor drives, cooling tower drives, and mixer drives. Bevel planetaries, they're, they're very compact and they're cost-effective. Uh, they're used in many vertical drive applications. Uh, one would be a crusher drive application that's common design. Uh, we see them in oil field applications as well. Uh, they're um, the top. They're used in the top drive applications. Very, uh, they're a, an excellent design for that application. So let's look at gearing upgrades. So. When we're looking at gearing upgrades, we're trying to see what we can do to improve the existing uh, gearbox that's in a particular application or some gearbox re requirement that, that looks at a higher demand and we're going to have to change something about the gearbox so that it's more suitable to the application. So our engineering capabilities are we can uh, upgrade to a carburizer and induction hardened uh, gear. This uh, provides a higher load rating, a uh, higher mechanical service factor, and provides a longer service life. So we can also optimize the gear ratios. Um, engineering um, can select a gearing ratio that's, uh, that's better suited for the application. We have uh, the availability of uh, better material selection. Um, and, and through the use of uh, form grinding, we can improve the tooth form. Uh, lastly, the, the accuracy in the grinding process can be improved. If the gearbox was designed with an AGMA 10 class gear, um, we can upgrade it to something in the 12 to 14 range, which is uh, going to give a, a longer service life. Sealing upgrades, very common. Uh, leaking gearboxes seem to be uh, something that drives everybody crazy in our markets. And um, we address this uh, on a regular basis. Uh, some of the very, you know, uh, least cost of upgrade would be improving uh, the sealing arrangement. So some of the uh, uh, seals that are out in the market are the Isomag, the Impro Seal, Mag Seal, and many other brands in there. And they generally are a non-contact mechanical type seal. So let's look at instrumentation. Pre predominantly on uh, high-speed gearboxes, uh, we still see many uh, gearboxes in the high-speed market that are operating uh, over a period of maybe 20 to 30 years and uh, usually just require some uh, bearing replacement for maintenance. Uh, the uh, customers sometimes come to us and ask us, can we improve on the instrumentation and uh, we can with some modifications. We can uh, we can uh, introduce some instrumentation. There's different types, and I'll kind of talk about that here. 
Um, but one of the things that uh, I made a note at the bottom is that by adding instrumentation or doing other upgrades does not change your API class of your gearbox. So you cannot go from an API class three or edition three to an uh, API edition five by adding proximity probes or accelerometers. Uh, you still have uh, a, a gearbox, but it's improved with adding instrumentation. So you have real-time monitoring. This requires much more complex instrumentation and it, and it requires a customer control system. You can measure vibration through the casing or the shaft position, uh, bearing or sump temperature. You can measure oil pressure and oil flow. In this case, uh, this gearbox is shown with some proximity probes and an accelerometer. Uh, very common in the high-speed industry to measure shaft displacement um, that can avoid some catastrophic failures. Very critical to some high-speed applications. Many times uh, we will be required to or requested to upgrade a, and introduce a loop system. This gearbox on the left hand side is a pump uh, vertical uh, gearbox design and it's it comes to us with uh, basically no lubrication. It does have an internal pump but uh, having the internal pump alone um, is a high risk because there may be uh, a uh, pump failure and then the gearbox would uh, would have starvation of oil. So we get asked to improve uh, these arrangements by adding some loop systems on a regular basis. The gearbox in the center has a basic uh, uh, loop oil system. It's got a cooler, it's got a filter, and it has a couple of uh, gauges on there so that you can monitor the oil uh, flow and temperature. On the right side is a little bit more complicated loop system. It has uh, some, uh, this was a customer requirement. So we, we basically added uh, most all of the uh, instrumentation and through this oil system that was uh, requested by our customer. And as you can see, it's a little more complicated. But uh, lubrication upgrades are very common with today's gearboxes. Okay, so we're going to talk about gear failure modes. Andrew, um, I think this is where we're going to take a gap here and you're going to throw out another poll. Yeah, sure. So I put up another poll. Have you been involved in a gear related failure investigation in the past? Uh, so it just ranges from no or yes, an observer, yes, as an active participant. Uh, yes, oh man, my uh, spelling is bad here. Anyways, yes, as a technical expert. So giving you four options. Now, lubrication upgrade, I have to say, it looks quite nice, quite pretty. Yeah, the, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of gearboxes that are operating um, throughout all the different markets and they've been in service for a number of years and, and most of them have very poor lubrication systems. So, when we get an opportunity to uh, upgrade the gearbox, the lubrication is generally one of the first things we we recommend is uh, a large part of trying to improve the service life of that gearbox. Yeah, that, it looks quite satisfying just looking at the, the system that's on there. Okay, we're gonna stop the polls here and we're gonna see how it results. 37% no, have not been involved in a gear related field investigation. So I think, think this will be pretty, this next part of the presentation will be pretty interesting for you. Yes, an observer, 20%. Yes, as a participant, 40%. And yes, as a technical expert, 23%. So pretty even spread. Um, I'll give it back to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, gear failure mode. So first thing I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna look at different types of gear failures. And then we're gonna uh, look at a sample um, failure analysis that we did on a gearbox. So let's go right into this. Okay, so different types of uh, gear element failure. So we have surface fatigue, and this is generally classed as micro pitting or frosting. So what is the condition? Well, the condition would be fine pitting of the tooth surface um, due to small fatigue cracks. 
Uh, these surface fatigue conditions can be non-progressive or progressive. Very fine pits look like frosting or matte finish. Uh, and you'll notice that something just doesn't look right on the gear on the flank of the tooth. And uh, with some, some uh, closer um, inspection, you will notice some of these fine pits and they, they can look like a, like a matte finish or they can look like small fatigue cracks. Now the cause is uh, minor tooth profile errors or local surface irregularity. So the gear tooth is not operating in a, a good rolling action uh, or improper lubrication. So what's the upgrade? So we improve the surface finish. We increase the oil viscosity. So we create a, a, a proper uh, separation between the mating surfaces. And uh, we can also increase the tooth contact area. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slides or two. So subsurface fatigue, which, which we also refer to as pitting. So what's the condition? Pits are generally initiated and form at or below the pitch line. The pitch line basically is where the two mating gears would uh, theoretically uh, mate uh, when they make contact. So uh, they're, they're really subsurface cracks that combine and as they combine and move to the surface, the metal starts falling out. So the cause uh, can be a number of things. One is a, you have a really high concentrated load in one area. Uh, and that creates a fatigue in the gear tooth. Uh, profile and lead error is very common. Uh, this is usually uh, uh, manufacturing issues or design issues. Local service irregularity, irregularity. So the surface, is it rolling correct? Is it proper? Is it mating correctly? And uh, of course, alignment can overload the gear tooth on one side of the gear and unload it on the other side of the gear tooth. Uh, it's, it, it shows up as a, as a fatigue. So what's the upgrade? So we can spread out the load. So three basic ways we do that is we, we increase the face width. So we, give, we, we provide a longer tooth. Longer tooth means spreading out the load and um, allows the, uh, the gear to manage the, uh, the, the forces that, that we're putting on that gear. And we can also improve the tooth contact area and the tooth accuracy. Those are the three basic ways we address uh, fatigue conditions in gearing. Corrosion, etch corrosion etching. So basically it's really obvious if you can see some rust on the gear, you've got some corrosion. It's really hard to detect if somebody comes along and polishes it off with an emery cloth and then you really, uh, you, you, you don't get to see what was sitting on the surface of the gear tooth. Uh, we always recommend uh, not to polish uh, or change uh, the condition of the gear before it's sent in for in inspection. Uh, corrosion, corrosion pits will be initiate, the initiating point for progressive damage. And uh, you can see by the picture what it looks like. It, it definitely looks like an etching condition. So what's the cause? Well, water or corrosive contaminants in the oil generally are the problem. Uh, we upgrade it with better filtration and, and breathers. We introduce a uh, loop filtration system and we find and correct the source of contamination. Where is it coming from? Next one would be uh, abrasion or polishing. And uh, if you look at the picture on the right, it's very uh, easy to see that it looks like some sort of polishing action is happening there. So what's the condition? Well, it's fine scale abrasion that causes that mirror finish look. It's like, it's like having a, you know, a buffing effect. Uh, polishing can be described as mild fine scratches, but there's usually not much material removed. Uh, for moderate polishing, the machining marks are quite visible. And this would probably be something similar to what that picture is showing you right there. And of course, severe would be all the marks are removed. So it's basically uh, removing a lot of material. So the cause is fine particle contaminants in your oil. If you see this condition, check your oil. It's usually a problem with, with cleanliness of the oil. And, uh, and your upgrade is better filtration. Abrasion, so debris damage. Uh, the condition is, you know, you're removing a lot of material on the tooth flank. We refer to the tooth flank basically as the uh, 
part of the tooth that rolls in and out of contact with the mating gear. So there's hard particles that are embedding in the tooth. Uh, it's very easy to see that something is squeezing in there and it's, it's debris, something's getting trapped between the two gear surfaces and it's causing a lot of damage to the gear tooth. Um, the cause, of course, hard particles. It's uh, hard to believe that a silicone or a silicate or anything like that, uh, that's not as hard as the steel that's, uh, that makes the gear will damage the gear, but it certainly can do that under high pressure. So again, improved filtration would be your upgrade. Uh, electrostatic uh, discharge, a little harder to tell. Um, I see here we've listed it as tiger striping. There's there's many different ways to describe it in the bearing industry. They call might call it vernelling or something of that nature. So the condition is very small pits that are really visible on the tooth flank, and they usually follow the pitch line. Um, what's the cause? Well, a stray current in the drivetrain. Something is introducing a current through the gearbox, and the arcing occurs as the tooth rolls out of the contact zone. It has a welding. Uh, uh, process and it and when it rolls out it pulls that weld that welded piece gets torn apart and that uh, leaves a pit so um, and if it continues you'll have overlapping pitting in it and it's it starts to cover itself up so there's but there are always characteristic bands so you can see that something looks very common between all of your teeth so you've got to replace or upgrade the grounding system you got to find out where the source of uh, like electrical charge is coming from. We have a material defect failure. It's, this is less common today uh, than it was maybe 25 years ago. Uh, a lot of the, the material suppliers uh, have improved their quality control tremendously. Uh, there's a lot of inspection processes before it gets to a piece of material will ever get to a manufacturer. Uh, so we, we find that the, the quality in the material is is becoming a less and less common but there are other conditions so uh it looks like just basically a tooth's been torn right out at the root or part of the tooth uh that the best way to find out what's causing that is to do an analysis a metallurgical analysis you need to look at it under a higher power microscope and find out what is actually actually happening to the material uh as i said unclean material is a is a is a cause but it's becoming less of a cause one of the things that we do see is case core separation so when you when you're carburizing a gear tooth you have uh you're, pen, you're penetrating the carbon to a certain case depth but if the heat treat process isn't done correctly then you will have a potential for separation between the soft material and the hard material and when that happens it's usually a dramatic failure such as what you see on this picture so uh, tighter quality control requirements and improved heat treat processes, usually the upgrade or the, uh, the way to, to uh, uh, stop this type of failure. So we're gonna look at a sample gearbox failure. Let's see how much, how am I doing for time? I have about seven minutes or eight minutes. So uh, this is uh, um, an area that what we find is, is there's some, there's misinterpretation in the marketplace. Uh, if we get 10 gearboxes in our shop for repair in one week, um, generally the customer will ask us for some type of a report. We still get a lot of requests for us to do a failure report or give them a cause of failure. But to, to make this really clear, there are two types of reports when we're, when we're repairing or we're going to inspect a gearbox. One is an inspection report where we tell you through the report what we describe, what we found in the gearbox, and we will um, build a work scope based on that. The, the, the second type of request would be a failure analysis. It's a much higher, uh, more in-depth process. It requires a lot more information. We usually have to do an investigation into the equipment that is uh, running in the field as well as the, the gearbox that we have. It involves a, a much larger scope. So um, we really wanna be sure that the industry knows there's a difference between an inspection report and a failure report. 
So the, the following would be a failure report that I'm gonna walk you through here. So to give you some background, this is a pulverizer planetary gearbox. Here's the uh, basic operating uh, specifications. It's 850 horsepower motor. Uh, the input RPM is about uh, 890, 900 RPM. And it's a right angle spiral bevel design. So the first, the first motion is a spiral bevel and the second motion would be the planetary. Uh, the planetary uh, is the output and it rotates the tabletop. So the general background here, when we got this gearbox, we, we learned that there were six gearboxes all put into service at the same time. And all six were showing really high noise and, and gear mesh frequencies after two years of service. Uh, the gearboxes were inspected and they saw an awful lot of tooth damage in the planetary section. Uh, because of the, the customer situation, they had to continue to running these gearboxes. And um, this gearbox was eventually taken out of service because of a complete failure. So let's look at what we found. Um, in the uh, second motion, which is the planetary section, uh, this is where most of the damage occurred. The first thing we noticed was that the ring gear, which is, uh, has an interference fit into the housing, had moved. There was a large gap from where it was originally positioned to where it was when we opened the gearbox to do our inspection. And that's an indicator there's something, some sort of forces going on in that gearbox that, that um, move that ring gear. So we continue to look. Down on the bottom of the gearbox where the spiral bevel is, uh, there was a lot of particles, large pieces of gearing uh, laying down in the housing, which we expected with that kind of damage. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, the spiral bevel gear was still in a very good condition. The next thing we did is we took the top cover off, which is the rotating cover. The cover has a, uh, is basically rests on these tilting pads. And there's supposed to be a sliding action, but there's supposed to be a lubricating film that separates the two. And uh, this type of wear that you see in this picture was, was not normal, it was abnormal. There's a lot of fine particles that were found in oil. And they were very worn. You can see the amount of damage on these thrust pads. So the next thing we looked at were some of the associated parts. So we have the uh, guiding pin, uh, where the guiding pins sit on the far left side, there was a lot of uh, pitting in that, in that pocket. Uh, there was uh, heat damage on the thrust ball. There was uh, wear at one location of the guiding pins. You can see on the far right, there was a, almost like a spalling situation developing on one side of the pin. And then on the thrust pucks, there was a lot of abnormal wear as well. So there was definitely some kind of uh, motion or actions going on in this part of the gearbox that created these conditions. The next thing we did was we looked at this ring gear and we noticed that the top part of the ring gear where the planet gear should be in contact with uh, was uh, a lot less damaged. So there was some wear there, so it initially did have some contact. But uh, as the damage progressed, we noticed that it, because it had moved up, uh, there basically was very little contact anymore by the time it failed. And the damage to the ring gear was significant. Next, we looked at the planet gears. So you can tell where the uh, ring, uh, the, the gears were operating against the ring. There was a, a definite high wear pattern in that spot. And there were some really bent teeth. So that tells us there's a lot of heavy pieces that were going through and uh, causing deformation under load. Uh, a lot of significant damage. Now in the sun gear, the sun gear uh, of course drives the, uh, is part of the planetary and runs against the, the planet gears, was extremely damaged. You can see it was tremendous, a lot of, a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of uh, forces and uh, just completely destroyed that part of the gear. Uh, but the spline in the bottom part of the, the, the sun gear were in relatively good condition. So we knew there was some sort of motion between the mating surfaces, we just had to find out what it was. Once we removed the uh, ring out of the housing, you could see the fret corrosion on the gear and the board of the housing. 
a tremendous amount of uh, sliding and, and rocking action. And uh, you can actually see where the gap was on the housing where it had moved up. And the etching and the uh, corrosion was mostly done after was mostly done after the gear had moved up, the ring gear had moved up in the housing. Uh, the spline coupling was in re remarkably good condition. So we looked at the, uh, the bearings down on the lower section of the gearbox, and you can see that they were actually um, turned sideways to the cage field and the rollers uh, pack, packed up and uh, very evident to see there was a problem there. So when we continued to look at the spiral bevel section, we noticed that the bolts, uh, some of them were actually broken right off and there was a lot of strip, uh, loose and strip bolts. So there was, a, again, some sort of a high, high force action applied to the, uh, the, the bevel gear housing. So, these are the things that we did in our inspection. We did a complete oil analysis, and we did in a, a, a deep dive into the material. We looked at the hardness, we looked at the case depth, we looked at the chemical compositions, we looked at the grain size, we looked at the inclusions, if there were any. Uh, we did a complete rating analysis using a AGMA 613 uh, to determine what, what should this gear be rated at, the, the uh, ring gear and planet gear. Um, then we used the ferro arm and we did a lot of measurements. We looked at the bearing pucks, the tilting pads, the bore alignment check. We looked at the top bearing plate, looked at flatness and the diameter. Uh, we did a complete inspection. So here are the considerations and our findings. So photos from the visual inspection prior to us getting that gearbox was that that ring gear had not moved out of position. It was still flush with the planet gears. So that told us that the movement of the ring gear was really a secondary failure, not a primary failure. The sun pinion damage was very unique and, and that the face width was aligned with the planet gears, but it was really damaged. So the top of the sun pinion was uh, uh, much less damaged than the bottom, which is evidence of misalignment. So uh, our Findings continued. We saw a lot of wear on the Babbitt thrust pads. The pucks and pins were damaged from misalignment more than they were from contamination. And the damage to the spiral bevel mounting plate basically told us there was severe dynamic forces on that bevel uh, gear shaft that transferred to the mounting plate. And uh, the, the bevel pinion bearing itself was really a secondary failure. So our conclusion, in the end, we pointed directly at the primary failure, which was uh, the misalignment of the planet gears to the gearbox. Uh, this was our conclusion. So what were our recommendations? We need to check for uneven loading in the mill, which would cause this tilting of the table above the gearbox. And uh, we could improve the gearbox by increasing the case depth of the carburizing on both the sun and the planet gears, which would increase the tooth strength, not the service factor, simply the tooth strength. And then we would make sure that the proper interference fit from the ring to housing uh, was done at, uh, at the um, assembly stage. And uh, using a hardened steel thrust pack would definitely help. But the primary uh, recommendation for this gearbox was to redesign this planetary assembly to incorporate a, a flexible coupling. And this would accommodate any misalignments from the table to protect the gearing from necessary forces. So really, the uh, the, uh, uh, the the uh, housing or the part of the gearbox that that we could that, that we could improve was putting a flexible coupling in, and it would allow the planetaries to run in a in a proper condition without all the forces that are coming from the mill above it. And that was number one. So a redesign was really necessary for this gearbox. Um, I think that, uh, I think I'm running out of slides here, guys. I think that we pretty much covered everything that I have. Um, Andrew, what do we want to do with this? You want to go out to some questions, Q&A section? Yeah, we got a couple of questions we can field for sure. Okay. Uh, well, just before we get to that, I was just curious, you know, with this, I mean, with the evident damage to the teeth, I mean, would there be much reason to do an oil analysis after the fact? Uh, well, 
no, not with the not with the severity of this this uh, uh, failure. But if we would have had some oil analysis done earlier, we would have noticed a progressive problem developing in the gearbox. Yeah. So it sounds like there probably wasn't very much condition monitoring to see the early uh, damage going on, right? Yeah. This type of application, being that it's uh, a pulverizer, is uh, it's a violent application to begin with. There's a lot of uh, movement and a lot of uh, inherent vibration in the system. So one of the things that really is necessary uh, with this type of a design of gearbox is to uh, introduce some way for the uh, the equipment above the gearbox to manage some sort of uneven loads and not transfer that those forces through to the uh, the planetary. Yeah, I guess that would make the whole system last longer. But I guess you could probably put, you know, particle analysis, uh, analyzers or online type of, um, you know, particle counters or online analysis, I guess, to check and see if you've got metals forming or building up in the oil. Right, right. So uh, there's a lot of improvements you can make to this design. Some applications, uh, we see the uh, less instrumentation and less um, uh, peripheral equipment that will allow you to do frequent inspections. It really depends on the application. Um, this case, this could have been improved with some additional equipment added for inspection, such as inline oil analysis or um, more frequent uh, vibration analysis. Okay. So we've got three questions here. Before we run out of time, I'm going to get through. Ralph mentioned asked about the uh, tooth profile science, and you know, I guess thinking that it's already well established. So what else can we do to improve the tooth profile? Um, the, the tooth profile. Um, a lot of times we have to be sure that we're we're um, uh, we're using a proper tooth root to tooth flank. Uh, profile that can be improved. So we, we try to stay away from introducing any uh, stresses at the tooth root. Uh, you can, um, th there's there's uh, the new tooth profile grinders out there that we use and there's many in the industry today. Uh, you, it, it's usually an uh, intellectual property. It's how you engineer the tooth form itself. And every company as uh, what they would consider their proprietary profiles. And uh, there, there's not a big difference between, between uh, OEMs, but there are some differences and everyone's gonna develop their technology a little differently. So um, um, it's, it's difficult to, do, to really um, describe that, but there are some variations in tooth profiles and some are better uh, at, uh, improving design. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Bernie, we have another question here from Harry Soccer, and it's in reference to what you were just discussing in terms of condition monitoring for gearboxes. Um, what, you know, obviously oil analysis, vibration, visual is all important, but um, would you put one ahead of the other for being the most critical for gearboxes that uh, kind of give you an indication something needs to be done? Well, generally, um, again, application kind of drives this a little bit. If you have a, you know, you have an application where there's an awful lot of um, vibration coming from equipment that's in the general area, it's going to be hard to do some condition monitoring that would give you some of the fine information you need, such as uh, uh, spectrum analysis and that sort of thing. But early, early prevention, early prevention generally done by oil analysis and regular condition monitoring. Um, we also recommend visual inspections on a regular basis. A tremendous amount of uh, um, gear failures can be prevented just by doing a visual inspection through uh, inspection cover uh, at a shutdown, have somebody take take uh, some part of the gear cover off so you can look at the gearing and do an inspection. That's, that's really highly recommended. 
Excellent. And the, the second part of that question, um, you know, what percentage of two service contact would you deem, you know, acceptable for, let's say, just general app applications overall, I guess? Because I, I, like you said, I think it'd be specific to different gear sets and applications, but is there kind of a, a number um, or percentage that you could use as a rule of thumb? Generally, it's 80%. Um, a lot of the gearing that we design at, at Standard Machine, um, we introduce uh, tooth relief at the tooth tip, and we also um, uh, give relief at, at the tooth um, end, so near the face of the gear. So what we want to do is we, we do not want any uh, forces to uh, be applied to the gear uh, at the ends of the teeth, say within an inch of each side of the, the gear, uh, and also at the tooth tip. So we want to make sure we don't get any interference when the tooth rolls into contact. And so we're, we prefer to see uh, a small amount when we do our roll test, so we might only um, have about 40% at the roll test without load, and then under load that will spread out to 70 to 80%. Excellent. Well, unfortunately we've run to the end of our uh, allotted time, but there were a few other questions uh, that have got, uh, that were unanswered, so I apologize we didn't get to those, but I would really like to still, you know, provide closure on those. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll post those on LinkedIn and yeah. with answers from Bernie, and I think that'd be a good way to go. So thanks everybody again for for this, uh, for joining us, and we'll be back next month. We'll be um, notifying you of what it's going to be, and uh, we'll see if we do it in person or not, but uh, well, yeah, fingers crossed. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, the invite and uh, the opportunity to do more with our society. It's always appreciated the work you guys do. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely appreciate your involvement to make it what it is. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.